Hello, everybody, and uh, thanks so much for being here for Deborah Cobalt Live. Have a fun, talented guest with me in studio today, Rebecca Metz, actress, who's currently in two shows at the same time. I don't know how you can remember those lines. I don't know how you do this, <laughs> right? Yeah, I have to try to make sure to say the right thing in the right place. Right, so um, the two shows are? Coop and Cammie Ask the World on Disney Channel and Better Things on FX. Right. And you just came from Disney, right? Weren't you yes. guys doing like sexual harassment training? Corporate harassment training day with my five uh, minor co-stars. So what do they do? Like they get older people and young people together like this is what you can say, this is what you can't say. It's um, like state mandated. Everybody has to do it, all employees. And these employees happen to be kids. So um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, sitting there talking about what's a protected class and what's appropriate work behavior and what is sexual harassment sitting next to a nine year old. And now you're coming here where there are yes. no no rules and no laws in this yes. studio. So Not there my you workplace. Go. Anything goes. <laughs> Just let it go. <laughs> so uh, so better things. Um, the episode that you're appearing in, this is the third season, mm -hmm. is on Thursday, uh, the 25th. That's yep. the next week. Um, do we have a clip of that? Can we go? It might not be the clip for next week, but yeah, at least yeah. we have a clip from Yes, I want to see whatever it is. There you are. Okay, let's go to that Honey, clip. you can't. What? What can't? You can't point at a 15-year-old boy's dick. I just <laughs> pointed. I don't want his 15-year-old dick pointing at my 15-year-old daughter. That was the point of that point. Oh, my God. You sequestered a minor in a room forcibly and pointed at his penis. Do you know how close to jail you are? Oh, well, sorry. Not really sorry. Hi, Tressa, do you still represent Sam Fox? <laughs> uh, yeah. So you don't? Did she fire you? Well, no, Jen, she didn't. I do represent her. Can I help you? I'm checking her avails for a pilot. Oh, for when? It shoots in March. It's the lead. The lead? Whose pilot is it? Danny wow. and Zach. That's okay, good stuff. Well, so what do you play? Um, so talk about sexual harassment. The first thing we do is, I know, who can we go to was, a clip? And then boom, you're talking gonna be about a theme. penises. Yep. So, okay, but that's on the FX channel. Yes. Let's be clear about that. That's not on the Disney channel, that's on FX. Do not confuse the two. Mm -hmm. Very different audiences. So you play Tressa. Yes. Tell me about her. Uh, so Tressa is friend and talent manager to Sam Fox, who's played by Pamela Adlon, who is the lead of our show. And she's executive producer, showrunner, lead writer. I know. You just director. Sort of, she's kind of like bewitched. You blink and she's over there yeah. as a showrunner. And then she's over there and yeah. she's on the show. It's like, well, like that's off to that Like mega girl. multitasking. But mm -hmm. so um, in life and on the show, she is a working actress and single mother of three girls with her mother living next door. So she's got a full life. And Tressa is her manager and friend and kind of part of the like inner circle family of choice who's around helping raise the girls and in the house all the time, eating her food and giving unsolicited opinions and advice. <laughs> it's a very real show. Yeah. I mean, the minute I watched it, I thought, I know these people. Yeah. I know that mom. I mean, I'm not a single mom, but I know lots like her. And mm -hmm. I know plenty of neighbors like you. The good friend always has good advice, always there to just do whatever. It really feels like the kind of show for me, and I've had a lot of people say this to me, that it's like... <laughs> It's the kind of show that you're like, oh, my God, I, I have been waiting to see these kinds of relationships between women and these kinds of women who are the women in my life, all my life. And I just didn't know that I was missing it until I got this show and was like, oh, there they are. You know, well, I know because they're real people that we know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're not like little dolls, which is fine, too. But I like to watch my people. Yes. You know, and people that I relate to, they're having problems. They don't know what to do with it. And um, yeah, it's great. Yeah. These are not like perfect women it's mostly written by women uh-huh yeah right? it's the mo the most female crew and cast i've ever worked with really and pam goes out of her way like she um this season went out of her way to find a female key grip which is that's not, not easy a, a position that's usually female the sound department like camera the positions there are certain positions on a crew that are kind of typically staffed by women but all of the positions on the crew. Right, like the ones the handing really out exciting. the scripts usually tend to be the girls. Yes, right? handing like, out the scripts. Here you go, here's Wardrobe. yours. Here you go, right. Yeah, um, but we've got women everywhere, which is uh, like kind of doesn't matter because everyone's great at their job and who cares, you know, like 
the gender of the person in the sound department, but it matters for me to look up and see that. Well, also, it's just sort of uh, breaking down boundaries. Absolutely. So now, you know, a guy or a girl can have this job. It's yep. like not a big deal. And the little kids on the show will look to that and say, they can really have any job. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's a guy or girl. And I think it's good for men to have the experience of uh, being on a predominantly female crew because it's been the other way around pretty much always. I think it's a healthy experience for Probably. them to be like, see what it's like? It's a little weird to, <laughs> you know, be like, oh, is there another... Yeah, but we're like more fun. Around? We make it fun on the set, right? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I don't so wanna... how did you, like, tap into this character? I mean, is she, is she you? She's not me. I mean, I've had a lot of managers over mm. the course of my career. So, like, that's a personality type that I understand, although there's lots of different kinds of managers. Um, but there's a person in my life and my family who she's a little bit modeled after. Who? Um, we'll I'm, dig them out in New Jersey. It, I have an aunt who is sort of like big personality, costume jewelry, very um, mothering, nurturing, um, caretaker of everyone, but also big, strong personality. What's her name? We'll give her a shout Aunt out. Auntie Anne. Auntie Anne. Aunt Deanne. Aunt Deanne. Hi, Aunt Deanne. And is Aunt Deanne from New Jersey where you come from? She's from Connecticut. She's Oh, it's kind of the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Aunt Deanne from Connecticut with but the big jewelry grew and up big in personality. Queens. My, all, both of my parents grew up in Queens, mm -hmm. as did Deanne. So it's the, you know, New York Jews. And the New York Jews. And they made their way to Freehold, New Jersey. They were yes. both singers, correct? Yes. They met at, um, oh, New York City chorus in high school my parents oh cute yeah so you came from an artistic background yeah. because that's always helpful when you want to get into the arts mm -hmm. they don't look at you like you're like what what do you mean so that's very that's very helpful right there they were very supportive and they were always doing concerts and musicals sometimes that I could be involved in I took piano lessons and so there was yeah there was a lot of arts in my house it wasn't totally zany that I decided, but I mean, the big difference was my parents kind of did it as a hobby, mm -hmm. and I and watching them do that and work these day jobs that weren't necessarily exactly what they were passionate about, although they're passionate about those things too. I was very conscious from an early age that like, no, I'm going to be an actor and I want to do this as my profession, not as a hobby. This is what I want to spend all my time on. So how did you end up going from, you know, Freehold, New Jersey, near Point Pleasant, you know, <laughs> sort of Bruce Springsteen land? Mm -hmm. um, and how did you make your way to Los Angeles? Um, I went to college at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, which mm -hmm. is like a, you know, prestigious acting conservatory. And toward the end of our time, they do this thing that a lot of the big schools do called, it's like a showcase or the leagues where you do kind of scenes and monologues in New York and in LA um, for agents and casting directors kind of kickstart your professional relationships. And I had never been to LA. I knew I didn't want to go to New York. I wasn't super excited by what was happening in theater out there at the time. And a lot of musical theater then, right? A lot of musical Big theater. Shows. And I've done musical theater, but like I could see who I was going to be like, oh, I'm the bread carrier in the chorus. And like, that's not what I wanted for myself. <laughs> no, you don't want to be the bread carrier. No. Right? Um, and, and The Sopranos was just starting, like TV Ooh. was just starting to be, it was the late 90s, just starting to become what it's become. And also after four Pittsburgh winters, I got off the plane here and I was like, Sold. Done. <laughs> Sold. We did the same thing. Yeah. We landed on Halloween night and it was like, okay. And I remember watching the news mm -hmm. and it had like 10 sun balls. And my husband uh -huh. and I looked at each other from Jersey and uh -huh. we said, how could this be? Yeah. How could there be 10 sun balls in a row? Uh -huh. And then there ended up being 30 sun balls. So I'm My with husband you. is from New Jersey too. And we, we've oh. been here for more than 20 years and still every January, like, you know, when the town is emptied out for the holidays and you can just drive to Santa Monica in 20 minutes and it's 75 degrees in January. It, mm -hmm. it's, I haven't gotten used to it. Mm -hmm. It will never get old. Call it your five sun balls. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you made your way out here. College showcase. Mm -hmm. They saw you and they said, that's it. No, that's no. not what happened. That's at all. not what happened. Okay. <laughs> so what happened? <laughs> I did not get an agent off of that showcase. Um, I, d I met a lot of casting directors who are still kind of my like people who call me in all the time oh. and help me get a ton of the jobs on my resume. Oh, but wow. it took me, I didn't like hit it big as soon as I got out here. I knew I wanted to move here, but uh, the industry was not like begging me to come to work the next day. It took me a good four or five years to figure out how to do it kind of on my own <laughs> to do the hustle and get myself in front of people and start booking work. Um, so yeah. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, they hear the stories of the Lana Turners, if anybody mm -hmm. knows who she is, and it just doesn't happen. You just 
to have to get your footing and figure it out, figure out who you are, who are your people who can help you get there. It takes time. And I think it, takes time. it does take time. And I think like so there were people in my class who got signed to big agencies right away. And um, I was jealous of them at the time. But the consequence of that was that when they sort of hit a rough patch in their career, they didn't have any of the skills they needed to do it on their own. See, So I am I feel very lucky that I had to learn that early and that there wasn't any kind of fancy person helping me early on because um, I had to figure it out by myself. And I think eventually everybody hits that point. I, th I think it's harder if you hit it big early and have to learn the hard lessons later. I'm you, glad I did it. The you're also very versatile. I mean, you could be the mother, the wife, the sister you know, the person that you uh, work with next door. You can mm -hmm. be the love interest. You mm -hmm. can be anything. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a great skill, too. Now, I know one of your first big, big roles, right, was on In Living Color? No? Where was it? Sorry, I got it wrong. Politically Incorrect. Politically Incorrect. I'm, 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 we can cut it out, but I got my shows mixed that's up. Okay. So Politically Incorrect, and yeah. who did you play? I played, I played Linda <laughs> Tripp. I can't even believe I wish we had a clip of that. Which is hilarious because that was, they didn't do a lot of sketches on that show. So when people see a, a credit for Politically Incorrect, they're like, were you a panelist? Why? Um, they did a sketch during the, you know, Bill Clinton scandal where we were all in high school and it was all like a <laughs> gossipy high school thing. And I was Linda Tripp in high school recording everyone in my locker. Oh, that is great. Mm -hmm. So was that like your claim to fame? And then it was like, look, she could play this. She could. It was very odd. They like put me in a bad wig and marched me to Bill Maher's dressing room. And um, he took one look at me and he said, she's too pretty, which I was delighted by. And That's they were one like, hell no, of a no, compliment. we'll ugly her up, we'll ugly her up. <laughs> Welcome to Hollywood. Yeah. Um, that was my first TV job. And I God, don't even know awful. if you could find it. I don't even know if you can find those episodes, but somewhere it exists. How tape. awful for Linda Tripp, for people to go, well, ugly her up, or, you know, I know. that's really kind of sad, but okay. Yeah. So, but you've been on all, no, yeah, sorry, decision. Linda, it's just, you know, playing you. Nip Tuck. Yes. One of your next ones. That was the first big one. Yeah. There was a lot of time between uh, Politically Incorrect and Nip Tuck, but that was the first big role. It was, it was very dark for them. Mm. So I played, I was kind of the patient of the week. The character name was Abby Mays and their episodes were always named after kind of the patient of the week. And um, I came into Christian, um, Julian McMahon and wanted plastic surgery. And he was in a very dark place in his life because he had just been left at the altar by his fiance who'd been kidnapped by a serial killer. He was, having a bad stuff. Week. he was having a bad week. And, um, and uh, he like, we did the surgery. He asked me out on a date. I go to his house. He wants me to put a bag on my head to have sex with him. Um, it was dark. And then it turns out that I liked it and I'm a masochist and I kind of turn it around on him at the end. It was it was certainly the craziest thing I'd ever done. And That's an episode. When, yeah, when you say like, oh, you can do anything. I was pretty sure no one was ever gonna ask me to like take my clothes off and have sex with the lead. Unless of like you a had plastic a surgeons in Miami <laughs> show. And it just was like, well, that'll teach you that I, I am not the expert on what people want to cast me as because here I am. Yeah. But it was a very memorable episode. And the casting director at the time was like, this is going to change your career. And it did. And it did. Yeah. So after that, you've been on the look, you've been on the Mindy Project. Why am I listing? You know, Mindy Project, Shameless, yep. Boston Legal. Yep. You know, and once you get all these credits to your name. Then you sort of, people know you, right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Um, it was after Nip Tuck, a really interesting thing happened because I went from like going into auditions. What I was comfortable with was going into auditions, having people not expect much of me and then being really good and pleasantly surprising them. Then I started going to going into auditions where people were like, this is Rebecca, she's amazing. And I was like, I'm not about to be amazing because this material is not amazing. So that took a little time to get used to but I could feel that it was less about having to prove myself and having to um, teach people who I was mm -hmm. and more about people knowing me and assuming that I had something to bring to the table and being like a peer or a contributor with them which was a, a really interesting and positive career shift you know to be like I don't have to strive so hard to get people to like baseline recognize me anymore that mm -hmm. was a big step so how did you end up getting um, 
this show and also the Disney Channel's mm -hmm. Coop and Cammy Ask the World. Can you please explain to me that title? <laughs> yes. Please? Yes. <laughs> so the big thing about this show is that two of the kids, Coop and Cammy, who are two of my four children on the show, uh, have an online Would You Rather style series of their own where they sort of crowdsource questions. So it would be like, would you rather... Um, the, uh, the pilot episode was, would you rather have your mom go in on date with the principal or take her to the school dance? So, so every episode is kind of framed around one of these questions. That's pretty smart, actually. Yeah, well, it's a, I mean, the kids these days are super into the YouTube series. And we're always going to events where someone's freaking out about some teenager who I don't recognize. And the kids are like, oh, he's got like three million followers on YouTube. I don't know. I, um, that's... I'm a generation. Good for them. Two ahead. Yes. Look, I'll do that on YouTube. I'll start asking questions. If I can get 3 million people, I'm happy to do it. I think I have a YouTube channel, but I don't have 3 million <laughs> subscribers. No. But so this is... This I have is, almost 2 million, though, views, which is kind of cool. Yeah. That's yeah. exciting. Hi, yeah. 2 million people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but so that's... Coop and Cammy Ask the World is them asking their audience these questions. Mm -hmm. Um but beyond that, the show is about the Rather family. I am Jenna Rather, the mom of the four kids. And then there's Fred, the neighbor kid who's always in my house. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. Always. I have three yeah. boys. Oh, And there were always, always people in, in and out of my house. Half yeah. the time I wanted to kill them because they would come in and they would just throw things around. And it's like, really? Yeah. And by the time they left, you know, after a while, I just had to give up. It's like, here, go. Just jump in the pool. I'll see you later. Yeah, that's that's kind of how I treated Fred last season. I might be a little nicer to him this season. We want to make sure that we're not <laughs> crossing any lines. Yeah, I had I, I have a friend whose house I was always in, and her parents were not, you know, were sometimes a little sassy to me. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I, I hope that they like coming to my house. Of I course, I mean, I yell they're at there them. all the time. Yeah, I mean, I yell at them, but the, whatever. You had good stuff in your fridge. They were yeah, there. Yeah, I did. I did. So okay, you're the mom of four four daughters, right? For, four. Two boys and two girls on the show. Two boys, two girls, and a neighbor. And Fred, who just won't stop coming over. Yes. Um, how do you tap into that? You don't have kids. You have pets. I have pets. Yeah. I have a lot of friends with kids. I actually have a very good friend from high school in New Jersey, who um, has uh, four kids, two boys, two girls, and lost her husband to a terminal illness. And on the oh. show. What the, one of the things we learn about the Rather family is that dad passed away two years ago. We don't talk about why it's the Disney Channel show, but but the family is coping with being a single family, single parent family, and mom is going to start dating again. Isn't it nice though that finally TV has caught up and they're yeah. putting like regular issues out there? You know, single mom, single mom who's going to date. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened to dad? I mean, you know, just all kinds of stuff, including um, your other show as well. I mean, yes. this is real stuff. Single moms everywhere. My yeah. other show, I'm a single working mom, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. How do you manage the two? How do you go from the FX channel? What do you have, like, this great limo service? They pick you up from one? <laughs> I am my great limo service. Yeah, I bet. Um, it's tricky, and I'm very grateful to the producers on both shows for being willing to work it out, which they do not have to, but um, working it out schedule-wise. So there were days that I bounced back and forth between both shows. Um, which was complicated, and you'd have to sort of make the mental transition in your head, driving from what's one set to the other set. And some weeks when I was doing a couple days here and a couple days there, um, it's that's the how the magic happens is driving across town at rush hour, trying that, to get from one show to the other. That's fantastic mm -hmm. to be on two shows at the same time. Mm -hmm. Wow! For a minute, we were trying to get me back on Shameless too, and I was like, I it, I cannot possibly get away with being on three shows at Why one time. Why not? That's what I thought, but it didn't actually end up happening. Yeah, but that's bad. how do you? Okay, dumb question, but this is someone who never could memorize lines. Uh -huh. Me, how do you memorize both lines from different kinds of characters? That's what delineates a good actor from one who isn't. You memorize your stuff. At this point, my memory is pretty good. I memorize Ooh. things really easily. I'm terrified for the day, like my actors friends who are older are telling me like it's not gonna last and I'm terrified for that day because no, but I couldn't do it at 18 like the line really? would be like wait what it's yeah. a muscle like the and you know I've gotten to use it a lot so I can memorize quickly now that's and, great but you gotta like if I'm if I ever have an employment lull I'm gonna have to like memorize poems or something because like it's a <laughs> use it or lose you do. it skill yeah yeah but that's pretty impressive mm -hmm. wow tell me a little bit about you what do you do uh, your husband is a journalist right he, he is he does pod he works in podcasting he, he uh he should have him on is primarily yeah absolutely he's yeah. a very good podcast guest mm. um he 
was the music editor for LA Weekly for several years. He's primarily a music journalist, but he writes about other things sometimes. And then, you know, weird things happen at LA Weekly. And now he is, he's a freelance journalist. He has been writing on podcasts lately. Um, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say about his podcast career, so I won't give any details, but he's a great writer, mm -hmm. super interesting. And he has, he, he studied playwriting. So like he speaks the theater language, he speaks the language of the industry, but he's not in it, which is perfect because um, I was dating actors for a while and I decided to stop doing that. And let's see, how you did you guys- You gotta have one civilian in the family. I love how you guys met. Please tell me this, you met on the internet yep. through- Okay, Cupid. Okay, that is hysterical. I agree. You know, you weren't swiping or anything because this no. is before the whole swipe Thank culture. Thank God, it was before swiping. But you go on Okay, Cupid, aren't you? Kind of like, you know. I, you know, like I think I approached it very much like I approach auditions. I was oh. like, this is a numbers game. Every no is one step closer to a yes. So I was very businesslike about it. I didn't get my feelings hurt. It was like, we'll go on a date. I'm not really into this. Have a super life. Dude, you get 15 minutes with me and that's it. Absolutely. You know I, mean? I think it was a little jarring to some people because I understand that not everyone approaches it that way. But for me, <laughs> Look, like, I, I, I didn't have to do that because I got married like too young. Uh -huh. But I have to tell you, um, you know how you could tell as soon as a person walks in the room, mm -hmm. you're like, Oh no, and I have to spend an hour with this guy? Yeah. That's gotta be really hard. Yeah. I feel like the nice thing about the online thing was that you get like, we're writing back and forth. I'm kind of a stickler for good grammar. And so if mm -hmm. somebody wrote me like a terribly worded email, I was like, we're That's out. That's it. My therapist at the time was like, you're being a little unreasonable. No, and you don't want like, someone who doesn't have good grammar. I'm the same way. We're all allowed a couple of unreasonable things in mm -hmm. our like personal relationships. I need a deep voice and good grammar. It's not, I don't think that's too much to ask. I like someone who's tall. Mm -hmm. My husband's not tall, though, mm -hmm. but I generally... We make exceptions. I make exceptions. Yeah. You know, I wear sneakers, and that's just all, all okay. That yeah. just works out. Yeah. So, you know, um, but that's kind of fun. What do you guys do for fun? Um, we're wine drinkers, yeah. responsible hobbyists. I should wine have drinkers. had wine for you. Why didn't I bring the wine? That would have been fun. We could have had some wine while we did our show. Anytime. Yeah. We can have wine not on the show. We can just have some wine. So what do you do? You just go to different restaurants and taste wine? We or? So we had a, there was a store, a wine shop in uh, the neighborhood where we lived that we would go to every Sunday. We called it church, hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> which might be offensive to some people. Um, but we went. Wait, what tasting. do you think the priests are doing in church? I mean, everybody's getting a little wine right? going on. So it's all good. We went wine tasting every Sunday and we like really developed our palates and learned what we liked and then started in California. You can go to Santa Barbara, Paso Robles, like there's all kinds of places you can just drive Fun. for the I weekend and drink, have some wine tasting. Yeah. It's a good hobby. And always something good to nibble on. Always. Uh -huh. There's always some good olive oil and breads and cheeses. Yes. It's a whole experience, and right? And wine country is beautiful, always. So mm -hmm. like if you go to a place where they grow wine, you're going to have good wine, good food, and it's going to be gorgeous. Like. And you just like a peaceful place. Mm -hmm. There's always sort of fun people to talk to, mm -hmm. right? Yep. We love doing that. I really don't drink much. It's more for me the taste. Yeah. Um, but my husband loves a good glass of wine. Mm -hmm. So we will do that from time to time. Now we're the people who people are like afraid to bring a bottle to our house because we're It's not picky. good enough. Yeah. I do that too with friends of mine who are like really picky. I'm like, John, just go to the wine store and mm -hmm. find like the best thing because mm -hmm. I get very intimidated. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid they're going to look at it and go, Oof. you know what I mean? So. But it, like, yeah. It's, yeah. We're not like crazy snobby. The fancy wine world goes way above where we're at, but we've gotten a little pickier. So when you're not watching your own shows, do you have a <laughs> <laughs> which I know you do you know, constantly. Mostly. Constantly. Um, do you have a favorite show that you like to watch? Oh, there's so many. I just last night went to the Top Chef Project Runway and the oh. Score Your Consideration event, and there were a bunch of people there who were like, "I don't watch these shows. I watch them rapidly okay. every season." Um, we just finished. My husband is rewatching Game of Thrones. Oh, everybody I know is on that. Do you know I, I haven't really watched it enough? It's I need, okay. I need to get back into it. Right. I I was kind of like hate watching it for a while, mm. um, and then finally I was like, oh, I think I just watch this show now. And so then I went back and like watched the whole thing. Um, and I like watching it with him. I'm not a Something crazy rabid fan. I'm not like I can't get into all of the serious fan people but i enjoy it there's a show kind of like star Central. wars people they're like Ugh. so into this game of thrones yeah know? it's like you're not allowed to be a casual fan nope sorry i am mm. there's a show on comedy central right now called the other two mm -hmm. so funny it's about um two like 20 somethings 30 somethings in new york and their little brother becomes like justin bieber famous overnight and how oh. it impacts their whole family molly shannon is the mom 
And, um, you know, the world of famous children is a little close to me right now. So it is it is it right. touched very close much so. to home in a hilarious way. Did you ever tell these kids that you work with that when if they even know what this is, that what inspired you to even act was the Muppet show? I found that very funny. Yes. There's the youngest kid on our show, Paxton. He's nine. Has He's an old soul and he knows all the like retro mm -hmm. pop culture. So he knows all the Muppet stuff. That is so cute. My husband just found his old Hot Wheels collection and gave it to Paxton and watching him open it, he knew Aww. the name of every one of the cars. Aww. Like it was hilarious. Oh, that is wonderful. I don't know that they've ever seen the Muppet show, but because we're in a Disney product, I think they are legally obligated to know who the Muppets are. Absolutely. You know. So in this day and age with lots of content being produced, you're on two shows. Yep. What's next like after this? Do you see what could possibly be coming out? Maybe creating your own content? Have you and perhaps your husband even written something yourselves? We should talk about it. I mean, I feel I yeah, kind of feel like on. I'm the last generation who didn't have it hammered into our heads that we had to create our own content. I know, I know. So it, it's not something that comes sort of naturally to me, but it does feel like in television right now, there's a real thirst for women's voices and for women in sort of producer positions and executive positions. You know, I've given it some thought. We'll see. Yeah, I have um, a thing. Women over 40. More, yeah. more stuff for women over 40. I mean, that would not include me. But, you know, women over 40, you know, um, moms, grandmas, you know, just people, bosses, just people, people just who are people. not moms or grandmas. Just something. Cat ladies over 40 who doesn't want to watch a show Anything. about that. I just think, you know, people are creating all sorts of content, yep. but real people, old, young, whatever. That, that's my thing. That's what I yep. want to see out there. Yep. So I just learned in my harassment training that uh, over Ooh. 40 is a protected class. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, We're protected okay. now. This Don't is good to know. feel protected? Yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is good to know. I've loved having you on. Any final parting words? I mean, everybody, please remember, on Thursday the 25th, Better Things on the FX channel. And on the Disney channel, Coop and Cami Ask the World. Mm -hmm. When is When can we see that? Um, we're in reruns now. We just stopped airing new episodes of season one, so you can catch it constantly mm -hmm. on Disney Now and the Disney Channel, and season two will be back in October. That's great. Thank you yeah. so much for joining us. My I pleasure. I had a lot of fun meeting you. Same. I had a lot of fun. I have to do a quick promo for somebody at the end of the show. Do you mind? Just kind of hanging around? No, okay. And this is the one I was talking to you about. Um, the uh, Jazz and Paz. Oh, mm hmm Yeah, this actually sounds really neat. Um, if anyone um, knows the singer Carla Perez, she's actually fabulous and she puts this on it's called jazz and paz and on april 28th it's the final concert of the spring 2019 uh series it features the eclectic collective which is uh carla she'll be on vocals and also musician nick mancini and his nine-piece band and for those people who are into the clarinet and all that uh john tagmeyer I mean, he's a very well-known clarinetist and it's kind of a fun thing to do it's at the neighborhood uu church from five o'clock to six thirty. if that sounds early they also have a wine bar so you can get a little, little that going on but carla is a very creative person and she does all kinds of things poetry reading um you know arts and stuff like that so go check it out it is on sunday the 28th of april and also one more um stop poaching now i'm on the board actually over there and they're going to be hosting something tonight over in west hollywood um, at Agos, um, get a chance to win the American Idol finale, passes to that, there's all kinds of prizes, and actually meet Damien Mander. He's in charge of Stop Poaching Now, and he works over in Africa, and he does a great job um, trying to keep poaching at bay. He's really outstanding, and most of his fighters, just so you know, they're women. He employs the women in Africa to just go after them, um, the poachers. So uh, two plugs. I just wanted to get that in there. And I want to thank you for joining us so much. My pleasure. Thank and you for I really me. had a good time. I hope you had a good time Same, here. I did. Um, I really enjoyed this. I hope you'll come back. Maybe bring your husband, I the podcaster. Oh, yeah. Fine. Right? We'll bring some wine. We'll make it a party. Oh, yeah. we'll, we'll bring some <laughs> wine. Bring the husband. Uh -huh. Do a whole podcast and just like, well, we'll see what happens. I love it. It's a plan. Yeah. All right, everybody, thank you um, for being here for Deborah Cobalt Live. Rebecca Metz, remember, next Thursday um, is her show, okay, and on the FX channel. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.